They say not everyone is born a villain, that there is always something that drives them there. While this may not always be true, it's certainly true in this case. The known kingpin, Juan Carlos Ramirez Abadia, was certainly born no villain. In fact, those who knew him before his disaster days actually call him an intelligent, kind, and mild-tempered boy. So, what went wrong? What made Ramirez the narcissistic villain he is known as today? In today's video, we'll cover all aspects of Ramirez's life, from his birth to his arrest. So, make sure to watch the video till the end so you don't miss out on anything. But before we get started, I would like you to take a moment and subscribe to our channel if topics like this interest you. Also, hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on anything. Juan Carlos Ramirez was born on February 19, 1963, in Palmira, Colombia. Apparently, he was born into a very well-to-do middle-class family and was very renowned as a child for his good manners and intelligence. He also excelled in schoolwork, which would later help him get into the University of Miami in the 1980s. This was after he had served with the Colombian Navy for a few years. It was said that it was during his time in college when he got more into drugs and matching up the time, it was estimated that he entered the trafficking business in 1986 under the Cali Cartel. Cali Cartel was a local cartel based in Cali, Colombia. This is where he first started operating. This is probably where he learned the ways of trafficking, which would later help him earn in hundreds of millions in the next 20 years. As one of the world's biggest producers of Colombian cocaine, Ramirez was excessively obsessed with the details of his trades. Even in his early years, Ramirez was believed to have smuggled multi-thousand kilograms of cocaine yearly into San Antonio, Texas, and Los Angeles by ship vessels traveling along the Pacific coast. His organization also had distribution cells all over New York, making them one of the biggest providers of the time. When authorities got a sniff of his operating places, he would simply switch to a new area. Similarly, when his drug invasion began to attract the attention of American authorities, and they started using radar planes to track the flight of his products, he would just switch the routes of smuggling. Ramirez was a man who liked to maintain quality to all his things, which is why he would often make quality control checks to his brewing place in Colombia to ensure that end products supplied by him is the purest in the bunch. He worked this way for years, and even his empire only grew by days, bringing him millions in profit. But there was a problem. By the early 90s, Ramirez had a wide array of traffickers working to bring his drugs into the US. But despite having so much workforce, it took months to get his material in and out of the states. That's when he met the Mexican kingpin, Joaquin Guzman, also famously known as El Chapo, who at the time was a newcomer to the drug business. But even so, El Chapo has a wide array of connections in the US, and he offered to smuggle Ramirez's products a lot faster for 40% of the share. The deal was fairly simple. El Chapo would safely smuggle the substance into the US border where he would take 40% of his share and Ramirez's distributor would collect the rest and sell it on their own. This was a little too much asking as the normal profit division was 37% and even then El Chapo was new to the game. But in the end, El Chapo managed to convince Ramirez by directly saying, I am a lot faster, you'll see. And with that, El Chapo took the first deal of smuggling 4,000 kilograms of cocaine into Los Angeles. Their relationship stayed stable for the next 20 years years, and as El Chapo became famous, so did Ramirez, known as his number one trusted supplier. Together, they supplied over 400 tons of Colombian cocaine to the United States, using El Chapo's secret airships at first. But when the US started to keep a lookout via radars, they simply switched to using fishing boats for their business. And so, through his multiple supply ring and other illegal businesses, he managed to make around 1.8 billion US dollars. Ramirez's successful career in the trafficking business had put him under the radar of the Colombian police officials and the U.S. government. So, to tackle the matter, they issued a warrant in his name. And for all the things he was capable of, Ramirez decided to lay low and let the matter pass. To avoid getting caught, he fled to one of his many luxurious mansions in Brazil. But when he traveled to the U.S., he was indicted not once, but twice. In 1994 and 1996, but both times the Colombian government turned down U.S.'s extradition 
mission request. It may come as a surprise to many, but after all the hiding and laying low, it was Ramirez who came forward and willingly surrendered himself to the Colombian government once he found that there was no escaping it. Some rumors even say that through his successful career, he had acquired many enemies who were now looking to finish him off at his vulnerable moments, few of which were his own cartel. And so to stay safe, Ramirez decided it's better to get behind the bars and under police protection. Even with a change in scenery, Ramirez ran his business perfectly fine behind the bars. He was sentenced to 24 years in prison, but was released only after serving two to three years of the sentence. After his first release, Ramirez had learned his lesson. He knew that if he had to avoid authorities in the future, he would have to have them on his side. So, he began bribing Colombian officials and police for protection. With government officials on his side, Ramirez simply went back to his normal life. But some people weren't happy with the news of his early release. And by some people, we mean the US government. They decided if the Colombian officials were not going to do their job properly, then they should take over. In 2004, the federal grand jury in Washington, D.C., indicted Ramirez on illegal substance trafficking and RICO charges on the account that he had trafficked nearly 500 metric tons of cocaine worth more than $10 billion into the U.S. from 1990 to 2004. The U.S. officially declared a bounty of $5 million in Ramirez's name for any information leading to his arrest. Now, with the U.S. actively after him, Ramirez panicked and took some very drastic measures. He went into complete hiding and even tried to change his face and take on a new identity. He had multiple plastic surgeries on all parts of his face to the point where he was just unrecognizable, but not in a good way. So many plastic surgeries had ultimately deformed his face, and some say his mangled face is hard to look at. His disguise worked well for him, and he evaded arrest for around two years before the police tracked him down using his voice. Because no one knew of his new face, and he always kept changing it, the US police took a different approach. They used voice matching software to track him down. The minute Ramirez answered his phone, he was recognized, his location was tracked, and he was arrested. He was living in a condo in Brazil with his wife. The security guard of the building said that he was very suspicious from the start. Apparently, during his stay, Ramirez kept to himself. He didn't talk to anybody and only used hand gestures. He didn't take anyone's call, and he almost never left his home unless it was for a doctor's appointment. After receiving the tip from the US, Brazil government arrested Ramirez in 2007. And during his arrest, police found gold nuggets and $54 million in cash. The US pushed forward to indict Ramirez, and finally, Brazilian police agreed to hand over the case, placing a condition that they don't charge for more than 30 years, which is the maximum years allowed under Brazilian law. Needless to say, in his trial, he was charged with drug trafficking, money laundering, and murder of more than 150 people. Among those people, 35 of those were the family members of a previous member who sold him out in return for less sentencing. Ramirez retaliated by killing 35 members of his family to set an example. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison without parole. After he was sentenced, he even attempted to bribe a police officer, but that only led to his assets being seized by the government. Doomed to serve his 30 years, Ramirez was losing all hope of early release when an opportunity presented in front of him in 2018. The catch? Nothing much. He'd just have to testify against his partner, the kingpin, El Chapo. Needless to say, he didn't miss the opportunity and opened up all the secrets regarding El Chapo in his testimony. It did help Ramirez shave some years off his sentence, but it also undoubtedly put an end to any kind of partnership between the two. What was your thoughts about Ramirez and his empire of drugs? Let us know in the comments section. Also, like this video and subscribe to the channel for more.